Hi, everybody. It's Stefan Molyneux from Free Domain Radio with Bill Mitchell, the host and creator of Your Voice Radio and one of the most influential non-candidates in social media this recent, now we put in recent election cycle, close to 150,000 Twitter followers, uh, 10 million Twitter impressions each day, and 40,000 retweets, according to a recent and occasionally snarky BuzzFeed article. Uh, welcome back, Bill. How are you doing today? I'm good. I'm good. I tell you, uh, those uh, my followers have jumped to uh, almost 150,000 as of election night. And uh, this is hard for people to believe, but uh, on election night, my uh, Twitter feed had 80 million hits. Wow, that is... Uh, 80 million and and uh, 400,000 retweets just on election night. <laughs> it was crazy. Well, f and, and for those who haven't been following uh, Bill's um, uh, Twitter account, which you should, and we'll put a link to it below. It's twitter.com slash Mitchell VII. And, um, you, of course, you can go to yourvoiceradio.com for his uh, radio show. Um, Bill is basically a Twitter machine. I, I don't think he even has a keyboard. I think it's just a psychic link to the central Twitter Borg universe because what do you do, like 200, 250 tweets a day? I mean, on average, it's uh, pretty it, it, pretty it, intense. It, it depends, uh, you know, on, on what I'm doing. You know, this last month of the election, uh, a lot more activity than there was previously. Um, but, uh, you know, just a lot to talk about. And election night, I mean, people needed somebody to, uh, you know, help uh, keep them off the ledge a little bit um, and to provide some objective analysis of what was going on as opposed to just what they were hearing in the media and what they were seeing on that map. Uh, when when uh, initially, when Florida turned blue and Ohio turned blue uh, and uh, Iowa was, was sitting out there blue and even Texas was blue, people were just about ready to, you know, slip their wrists. But I was telling them, uh, just wait and, you know, listen to me because there's stuff going on that you guys don't see. So kind of worked out. Yeah, those of us who've been plugged in deeply to this political cycle, when well, we have contacts, we have information. I, you know, I, I sort of, I envy your uh, openness with regards to your predictions of a Trump win, Bill. I mean, it's very, very impressive. I was confident of a Trump win, but I don't know if, if you know, an, an overindulgence in Star Wars when I was younger, your overconfidence is your weakness. Uh, but um, I was concerned to say, uh, it's in the bag, no problem, don't worry about it, because I was, and you know, maybe this is manipulative, maybe it's not, but I was concerned that it was going to give people overconfidence followed by less stringent action and become a self-defeating uh, prophecy. Uh, but you didn't take that approach. You were like, it's in the bag, don't worry, he's a changed candidate, he's got it done. And, uh, you know, so you have, you, you get the medal and the honor of predicting from the very beginning, whereas I was hedging in a way, uh, though it was not my true uh, feelings deep down, but I was concerned that overconfidence might turn it the wrong way. Yeah, well, my experience is, that uh, you know, if you're uh, if you make a bold prediction, or you hedge your bet, if you're wrong, you're still wrong. But if you make a bold prediction, you're right. They'll never forget you. And uh, <laughs> that's kind of the direction that I went on that uh, was that uh, you know I just I was looking at I was looking at this election structurally and historically, and realizing that over the past six elections, only one. Um, party has received a third term for president, and that was Bush uh, after uh, Reagan. Typically, the party gets uh, thrown out, and you can tell a lot by how well the preceding president does in his second election. Uh, when Reagan's party got a third term, he had uh, done even much better in his second election than he did even in his first one. Whereas when Obama won re-election, uh, he had won by uh, fewer votes than his first election, which I believe is the first time that ever happened in history where a president was re-elected with fewer votes. So it showed that there was quite a bit of fatigue for him. And uh, a lot of uh, his support was really based on just his cult of personality, not as opposed to what he had actually achieved. So for Hillary to when a third Obama term would have been historically uh, almost impossible, especially given the other dynamics that were happening out there. So I saw that and I saw this was a, a change election and change candidates win uh, change elections. It's just the way it goes. And in the last month, the only blo uh, block to that was Trump not being a reasonable candidate. In the last month, he presented himself as a reasonable candidate for commander-in-chief, and that's all those 15% on the fence needed, and it was done.
So there, if, yeah, so there's a downdraft, which is the, the third term factor. Of course, the updraft is Hillary's intrinsic likability, integrity, and honesty. So clearly, there was a battle going on in in the tube of political windstorms, uh, and uh, that uh, sadly, uh, her innate likability and honesty wasn't enough to swing things. And of course, with Reagan, there was of course the boom that occurred with Reagan. There was the end of the Cold War. There was the optimism uh, that occurred. Now, some of that was a bubble, and uh, I certainly didn't was not a huge fan of Reagan's no fault divorce stuff when he was in California. I was not a huge fan of the legalization of three million illegal immigrants, which then became 10 million illegal oh, illegal immigrants, uh, 10 million um, uh, voters in general for the Democrats, which turned the uh, the California red. And now they're talking secession, to which I think some Americans are like, hey, let's help you push, you know, it's activate that San Andreas fault. You can have your own island. Uh, but um, it was uh, quite a bit of momentum that was occurring. And of course, uh, the uh, Bush Gore was very close, very close. And I mean, it of course went for those who don't know, it went into law land and it went into recount land for, for quite some time. But this, at least from the electoral college standpoint, wasn't close at all. No, it wasn't close at all. I think we're going to end with 306 uh, for Trump as far as the electoral college. And uh, he may still win the uh, popular vote because there's still uh, about 8% of the vote that hasn't been counted, and most of that is in red areas. So, um, yeah, Trump may still win the popular vote as well. He's only about 200,000 votes down uh, now. So, And, uh, you know, the fact that he didn't win right outright the popular vote is mainly because California and New York went two to one for Hillary. So they kind of biased the sample. But, you know, I, I think that it's great that we have the Electoral College because it, it means – that most of the country got the candidate they wanted as opposed to three major cities, you know, New York City, Los Angeles, and San Francisco, which is dominated by liberals getting to pick who rules the the rest of the nation. So it really worked out. Now, it seems to me that um, the strategy pursued by the mainstream media, which I think was, and this sounds a little conspiratorial, but I actually feel that the term conspiracy theory uh, needs to be retired because now it usually is just sounds crazy, but we're just waiting for confirmation, which will inevitably come. But it seems like the mainstream media and particularly the polls were engaged as a weapon of war, as a kind of psyop of demotivation for the Republican side. But I think that what actually happened was by being so hysterically aggressive towards Trump supporters, by painting him as evil, as Hitler, as a monster, as racist, what they did was they drove Trump support underground. Now, if you're in a battle, there's one thing you really, really need, and that is to have an accurate estimate of your enemy's strength. And by driving the Trump supporters underground, by, oh, no, I don't support Trump. I really do support Trump, but I'm not telling anyone. Uh, They basically said, oh, that that the army of the, they're able to field very, very few people, except for these crazy people on the internet who says there's and Trump supporters, you don't want to drive your enemy's army underground. You can't count them anymore. And then you slack up. Yeah, I think there's a lot of truth to that, uh, Stefan. The Achilles heel of the Democrat Party has always been that they spend so much and they lie so much and they end up eventually believing their own spin and their own lies. And then they uh, base strategy upon the false premise. And the strategy ends up blowing up in their faces because they base it upon their own lies. It's just kind of a a weird, you know, dog chasing their own tail uh, sort of scenario. And I think that what happened, everybody uh, on Twitter was worried about the cheating. Oh, they're going to cheat. They're going to cheat. And I think what may have happened is that they had plans to cheat. Now, the cheating that we needed to worry about was not some people sitting in an office in Broward County filling out fake absentee ballots or a busload full of illegals going to a poll, the cheating we had to worry about was an electronic cheat that nobody would ever see. I mean, you'd never see it. It would take place. But it's very that's very risky because, of course, that's a major federal offense if you get caught doing that. So I think the Democrats were only going to try to pull something like that off if uh, it was their, op, you know, their uh, plan Z, where there was no other way they could win. And I think that what happened was they ended up believing their own polls where they were going to win this race by four or five points. And I think they said, you know, we don't have to do the electronic cheat because, you know, we've got this. We've got this. And then uh, they didn't have it because, like you said, you know, it's like they just they just uh, sent their scouts over the hill. And uh, you remember the old um, the old uh, shows where the gladiator shows where, you know, the gladiators would be walking across the field and all of a sudden the enemy popped out from their little hidey holes, you know, and they surrounded them. And, and that's kind of what happened here is like you said, uh, they drove the support underground uh, in their polls. They didn't see it. And uh, then on election day, we got them and they didn't have their cheats ready. Well, and 
they, they, <laughs> the idea that there was uh, going to be cheating on election night to me is kind of rich because there was, uh, semi, to me, so much cheating before election night. I mean, having the entire mainstream media pretty much in the tank for you, having uh, your, um, your, your questions for debates fed to uh, the, the candidate. Um, uh, this is, I mean, there was so much that was going on, uh, you know, this, uh, this uh, the sending out these, these bird doggers, right? They're hiring these mentally ill people or crazy people to go and start violence at Trump rallies and then complaining that only the Trump people uh, are, um, are violent. This woman who claimed that, that Trump had, uh, attacked her when she was 13, who then had to withdraw, that was all published. And all of the ridiculous, in my mind, these sexual assault allegations and so on, which, you know, half an hour's reporting can, can dismantle fairly easily. There was so much cheating that went on ahead of time, and they still, still couldn't win. And I think that just shows um, the, the support that, that Trump really had, that they simply couldn't guess because they live in such an echo chamber of disinformation that you're right. They, they start believing they really are at war with East Asia. Yeah, 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 exactly. I tell you what, I knew on election night, there were a couple of signs I knew that uh, we were probably going to win because I assumed we were going to win anyway. But, you know, when I they got the confirmation, was when uh, we saw that for that poll, that exit poll from Fox News, because a lot of the exit polls were really hard to read, especially the ones from, you know, if you watch the exit polls from MSNBC, it was all like, you know, Hillary landslide. I mean, well, it's MSNBC, right? But I saw the, the exit polls from Fox, and the one that stood out to me was when they said, which candidate is the change candidate in this election? And Trump won like 88 to 12 or something like that. I'm like, if this is a change election, that's over. And then when Indiana and Kentucky returns first started coming in, and people say, well, Indiana and Kentucky, those are red states. You know, what can you tell from that? Well, for instance, in Indiana, the RCP average had Trump with a 10-point win in Indiana. When the returns first started coming in, he was 50 points ahead in Indiana. And I'm like, you know what? That's the monster vote. That's crossover Democrats. That's Bernie voters voting for Trump or staying home. That's what's going on there. And we are going to win this election. And that's how it turned out. Now, just so people can can understand you for months have been talking about the methodology of the polls, the methodology of information gathering about this election is hopelessly right, right. skewed, hopelessly biased. Can you just step people through the major mechanics that people use to jig these numbers in favor of the Dems? Right, right. Well, the best example of that would be uh, IBD, which ended up getting the, the poll right, you know, very close to right. Um, and uh, uh, but uh, yeah, what would take place, for instance, IBD is one of the few pollsters that shows you their raw sample versus their reweighted sample. And uh, during the primaries this year, we had what was basically an R plus one turnout, meaning that there were about a million more Republicans that voted in the primaries than Democrats. And that's actually greater than that because uh, Trump wrapped up his nomination a month before Hillary wrapped up hers. So, you know, things really slowed down for us in the last month. So it could have been uh, two million more voters than the Democrats had. Now, during the uh, 2008 cycle, uh, the Democrats had about a D plus eight uh, primary turnout. And then when they won on election day, it was a D plus seven turnout. So very similar. But then we had an R plus one primary turnout and all these pollsters were uh, polling D plus eight, D plus 10. I saw D plus 16 polls. It was completely insane. And so you realized that what they were doing was they were saying, you know, Hillary is going to get the same sort of support or even stronger than uh, Obama got because they said she's going to get the same black support, the same millennial support, and uh, the same, and plus a bigger turnout with women, and therefore we're going to give her even a bigger sample uh, advantage than Obama had. And I'm like, that's not happening. I mean, there's no, there's no enthusiasm here. There's no. You looked at the uh, empiricals on the ground. You looked at, uh, you know, the rally turnout and merchandise sales and book sales and uh, you know social media presence. And there was no evidence of enthusiasm for Hillary anywhere. And yet you had this evidence for Trump enthusiasm all over the place. But one more point real quick about the rally size. People are like, oh, you can't tell from rally size. Bernie had big rallies and everything like that. Well, you know, Obama had huge rallies in 2008. But as you recall, he didn't have big rallies in 2012 at all. He had a hard time filling a high school gym. So what's, but yet he still won. So what's the difference? Well, what those rallies show you is not just, you know, voter enthusiasm. This is very important. They show you new voter enthusiasm because the people who will stand in line for six hours to go to a rally are new voters that want to experience the whole thing. They want to touch it. They want to feel it. They want to be a part 
of it. So they're willing to go to stuff like that. Old hat voters, voters that have you know voted lots of times, they're like, yeah, I've said, I've been to the rallies, I've done that. You know, I'm not going this time. It's a hassle. So that's what took place this time is when we saw those huge rallies, that was the monster vote. That was the new voters that were coming out for Trump that had never voted be before, especially the white uh, middle class voters, the white blue collar voters were coming out for Trump. And that's what you saw a lot of at those rallies. People say, oh, these rallies are, are you know, largely a big, you know, majority of white voters. And as, um, oh, who was it? Uh, um, oh, I can't think of it. One of the pundits had said, that uh, um, Trump, you know, the Republicans always want to get the minority vote. And yeah, that's important. But if the Republicans could just get the white vote to turn out, they would win. And that's what happened here, is that not only did Trump improve his numbers with the black community, with the Hispanic community, but he dramatically improved them with the white community. And that's what won. Well, and I hope to some degree, and it, it certainly is hope against hope when it comes to the leftists breaking out of their little circular train track of repetition in their brains, but uh, I hope that this is going to push back against some of the identity politics. Because, you know, the, the, the left is always sort of talking about the right being racist and sexist and all that. But the reality is that uh, Hillary won fewer voters than Obama did in 2012. Yep. And, uh, you know, it turns out uh, has vagina is not really the very greatest platform that you could imagine and doesn't overcome uh, a truly evil record as uh, Secretary of State and, and a complete disaster as, as, a, as a campaigner. But um, this reality that blacks and Hispanics turned out. It, it turns out a lot of Hispanics to move, who moved to America, who, who ripped up their lives, who went through legally, who went through years and years of, of trying to get to America, actually want America to stay the country they moved to. I, I don't know how that's hard for people to understand. If I'm going to overturn my entire life, learn Japanese, move to Japan, it's not because I want Japan to turn into Iceland. It's because I want it to stay the country I actually moved to. And this idea that um, uh, the Hispanics who, who, who've left Mexico because they don't like Mexico and like America really really want lots and lots of people to come from Mexico and turn America back into the Mexico they fled and upturned their lives to get away from. How is this hard to understand? It's not all identity politics. Sometimes people have values that they want to pursue and maintain that aren't in accord with where they left. Sorry for that rant. I didn't even know there's a question in there, but it just no. bothers me. <laughs> no, it's absolutely true that, uh, and you know, this is another mistake that the Democrats make. They, number one, they believe their own spin. Number two, they always take it too far. They always overdo it. For instance, with Obamacare, if Obamacare had fed um, America, or no, Obama had fed America Obamacare a piece at a time, you know, sort of boiled the frog, as they say, where we, we sort of got used to it over time, it might have ended up being much more popular, but they, they overdid it. They gave it to us all at once, and it, it freaked people out. You know, it was, it was too much. And I think that this is... Um, what happened with Obama's uh, open borders policy is the people that were here legally, the people that actually could vote as a Hispanic community, saw these, you know, hordes of people streaming across the uh, the uh, borders and all the gangs and all the disease and the crime, and they said, "Man, we don't want those people in our neighborhoods. We like our nice." peaceful neighborhoods. These people are all going to move here. They're going to take our jobs. They're going to bring crime. There's going to, you know, or they're going to become here and they're going to be unemployed. So when they're unemployed, they're going to have to resort to crime. They're going to be robbing our homes, you know, raping our uh, women. And this is, you know, what they saw. And, and, like, and they, know, they, they know this group. This is what probably, this is what they moved to get away from is the corruption and the right. crime in Mexico. Right. Right, right. Because, you know, they looked at those people streaming across the borders and it's like, those don't look like doctors and lawyers to me. Those look <laughs> like people that want to come and rob my house, you know. And so it's just kind of I, I think that, that the, the um, it's funny that the um, left is always talking about the right being racist and bigoted. And yet the left is always the ones that are putting people in baskets, baskets of deplorables. That is so symbolic for the way they view people. They don't view people as individuals. They believe, view us as groups that can be manipulated. And this is what finally broke down. But I tell you, Stefan, <clears throat> here's what has the Democrats the most afraid of all, is that we, it looks like we're going to win Michigan, Michigan. We're ahead in Michigan. We took Wisconsin, Michigan, and Pennsylvania. Okay. <clears throat> we broke the Democrats' decades-long uh, stranglehold on the Rust Belt. Now, if Trump can get in there and do a good job for those, job for those people, Democrats could be out of power for a long, long 
time because without those three states, wait, they just wait, can't Bill, win president. Bill, just say that again, but slowly. We're going to set it to music. Can you just Democrats again? But one more time, one more time. Okay, here, here's the thing. We won Michigan, Wisconsin, and Pennsylvania. Okay, without those three states, Democrats can't win presidential elections anymore. They just can't. Okay, we almost won Virginia. We almost won uh, Minnesota. Minnesota was damn close. Okay, without those states, Democrats can't control Congress. They can't control uh, the White House. And if Donald Trump can come in and deliver on his promises and do a good job, the Democrats may be out of power for a very, very long time time. Oh, it's, it's even better the second time around. Thank you. Now, uh, uh, so my very brief view of the Rust Belt state goes something like this, that um, uh, manufacturing has been uh, eviscerated. And it takes being a real intellectual, it takes being a real academic or a real reporter or people who just don't move in those circles to ignore the fact that America over the past what decade or two has lost 50,000 manufacturing jobs every single month. And our manufacturing is sort of for the middle of the bell curve of intelligence. You know, one Wonderful, decent people. It's their step. They don't have to go to college. They can learn a trade. They can go from high school uh, into into these uh, jobs and have great, solid jobs. Raise their families. Uh, have have wonderful lives with communities and all of that. This has all been eviscerated yeah. now. There was, of course, the promise under free trade. Oh, there'll be some transition. Don't worry. Uh, you may be out of work for a while, but it's going to come back. And so when people fee are looking at transitional unemployment, what do they look for? Well, they look for government support. I need some, some government support to tide me over. I need some unemployment. I need some welfare. It's going to tide me over. And then all of these wonderful new jobs with better pay and better benefits are going to just sprout up. And then, uh, you know, uh, after, what, 20 years or so, uh, I think that people are kind of getting those new jobs ain't, ain't a sprouting. They're not coming back. And so now they're, they don't want the Democrats to give them free stuff anymore. They're sick of it. They're tired of it. It's something that we all want. Ooh, look, free stuff. And then after a while, it's like, I don't even want to get out of bed. I'm so depressed and feel so inert. You know, we are human beings. Uh, our, our souls, our minds uh, uh, strengthen through resistance like our muscles. And so I think that they finally get those jobs are not coming back. Someone's coming along saying, I'm going to get you jobs. And they're like, okay, good. I can let go of government support because here's going to be somebody who's actually going to get me a job and revitalize my community and revitalize my life and give me purpose and a sense of control again. And if he delivers, I don't think they're ever going back. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I tell you, you know, if you're starving, you'll happily eat a bug, you know, if you're starving. But if you're not, then the idea of eating a bug is kind of disgusting. And I think that this is what happened in the Rust Belt is that people, you know, they, they are just tired of eating bugs. They're tired of just surviving. They want, they want something better. And, you know, it's like Maslow's hierarchy of needs. If the Democrats keep everybody just at the survival level, which is the lowest level, it's just, you know, part of self-actualization is to move up Maslow's hierarchy of needs to the self-actualization level where you actually are proud of your life. You're not just existing. You have a, a career. You have a future. And Democrats always talk about creating jobs. We don't talk about creating careers. The reason why uh, Obama had some decent job creation was that he took somebody who has had a one full-time job where they had full benefits and they were raising their family and their, their spouse didn't have to work and uh, everybody was happy. And uh, that person lost that job and had to go out and get three part-time jobs just to make ends meet, didn't have health care, had to go over to Obamacare. Tremendous stress, uh, brought that stress home, you know, fights in the family and so on and so forth. And uh, in Obama's world, you know, you lost one job and created three. Well, you just created two jobs. Hallelujah. You know, and that's not what people want. People don't want just jobs. People don't want to just survive, but they want to thrive. And this is what Trump uh, was running on is like, if you elect me, you're going to win so much, you're going to get tired of winning. You know, they talk about uh, how you influence people with words and the word imagery of winning. Everybody gets that. And so that's that's what Trump was running on. He was Trump running on a uh, platform of thriving. And I think that's what the people in the Rust Belt wanted to experience, and that's why they elected him. And I think Obamacare was um, an underestimated influence on this election. Um, I, I have real sympathy for the insurance companies who are currently being j dragged around like some helpless water skier tied, <laughs> lost his skis and is just bouncing around the water because the regulations and legislations are changing so continually. 
But when people, of course, didn't get to keep their plants, when they didn't get to keep their doctors, when this promised $3,000 reduction in their premiums didn't materialize, but instead, and they claimed it was 20 or 30%, but I mean, the numbers I'm seeing were far higher, multiples higher than that, increases uh, in their premiums. Uh, when you start messing with people's health, particularly the aging population, you really hit them where they, where they live um, because there's no subsidy for bad health. You know, you lose your job, you can get unemployment insurance, you can survive, but if you get sick and and you or can't get or you can't afford or it's it's sketchy to get the health care or you're worried about the future um, ability your future ability to pay for health care that really hits people and the young don't get that you're young you're bouncy you're healthy i'm immune i'm invulnerable i'm bulletproof i'm super yes you are and you're young um but uh, i think that the angst because normally of course the old are fairly keen on government programs and a lot of them are sort of surviving on that but the reality is that i think messing with people's health care uh, really hits them where they live and th that gives people sleepless nights you know you see that bill and you're like i don't have the money to pay for this I, how how can i survive and the answer of don't worry it's succeeding because we're subsidizing it is like saying no 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 I'm, I'm a very fast runner because I'm driving in a car it's like no you're not a fast runner the subsidies do not make something work and I think yeah. seeing the one-sixth of the US economy that the government took over with Obamacare beginning to unravel the promises that weren't made the savings that not only failed to materialize but went the complete opposite way the doctors lost the plans lost and Hillary not saying much about it uh, at all I think gave people a real sense that something better change or you know that grim reaper might be the next person they get to vote for yeah, exactly. Well, you know, in 2012, Hurricane Sandy uh, saved Barack Obama and um, gave him a chance to look like a leader one week before the election. In 2016, Hurricane Obamacare uh, may have cost <laughs> over the election because it just reminded everybody, wow, you know, do we really want four more years of this? Also, I think that people were just tired of, of the Clinton brand. You know, all of the all of the scandals constantly. And, uh, you know, the media thought that Comey coming out and letting Hillary off the hook at the end uh, helped Hillary. But <laughs> no. actually it hurt her. It just reminded people that, you know what, uh, Trump is right. We have got to drain the swamp. This is just ridiculous. There's no way the FBI investigates 650,000 emails in eight days and comes up with a, a conclusion. And people are just like, no, you know, we're, we're done with this. And it's just like these, these protests that are taking place in these cities that are, you know, basically uh, astroturf uh, protests by uh, Soros uh, in the cities, you know, Trump isn't our president, all this other crazy stuff and the, the violence and, and the uh, vandalism and all that. All they're doing is reminding America, yeah, we picked the right guy because this is not what we want. You know, we don't want to live in a computer game post a lot, uh, post a pop, post-apocalyptic that's the word i was looking for uh world you know that is like got basically zombies running around turning over trash cans and peeing on police cars you know we we want a peaceful world for our kids to grow up in so they're just you know showing us uh what we didn't want and thank god we voted trump because he's the opposite direction from all that well you know and it's funny the drain the swamp thing uh, i was thinking when florida was sort of teetering in the balance well the whole state exists because all they did was drain swamps. I think they're on <laughs> Trump's side. And that, that's, yeah. that's all they do is wake up in the morning and say, oh, that swamp's a little closer. We we better drain it, hoping we don't have alligators. And I think this um, post-election, it's very predictable that there was going to be riots post-election. And, and we know that because the left always projects. Whatever they accuse you of is what they're actually planning in their secret, dark, bitter hearts of darkness and doom. I mean, so right. when they said, well, are you going to accept the outcome of the election because it's down? I mean, that's because they thought they were going to win and they were going to use that concession to force people to conform to, you know, if there were evidence, if there was evidence of cheating and so on. And so when they accuse other people, well, particularly when the left accuses um, somebody in power of sexual impropriety, oof, I don't know that they want to step on that landmine. But um, when they say, well, you know, you're not going to accept peacefully or you're not going to accept the results of the election, you know, for sure, without a doubt, and I, you just people can really you can bet money on this if you want you know for sure that they're not going to accept the results of the election if they lose and this is the kind of stuff that is uh, going on at the moment and yeah you're right it just reminds people that uh, it's now turned from anti-trump to anti-democracy uh, the one okay the second uh, that's a little bit more destabilizing when it comes to how society makes its fundamental decisions yeah yeah, yeah. I, I think that uh, what you've got in uh, the Democrats, the far left, and what you've got uh, is the same thing as you had in Never Trump. You know, in Never Trump, you had a, a few people making a lot of noise. And quite often on the far left, you've got a few people making a lot of noise. But most people, you know, like I said on Twitter a long time ago, 
that America is, is basically 20% far left, 20% far right, and uh, 60% in the middle that just want to make America great again. And those people came out and voted uh, this time because, you know, people, they say that your uh, happiness is a measure of what your life is like compared to what you expect it to be like. And living in America, people expect us to be special and exceptional and number one and a great country. And when we're not, that creates a lot of unhappiness out there. That's why when people were asked, are you happy with the direction of the country? 72% uh, of the people said no, because this is not what we expect America to be like. And uh, so I think that Trump offered them a chance, an envision, a visualization that we could get back to what they expect in their hearts America to be like. And that's why uh, that's why people came out. And uh, I just want to say thank you to President Obama. Uh, when he took uh, office, he controlled uh, both houses of Congress. I think uh, a great, a great uh, amount of state houses and uh, the White House. And in eight years, uh, he destroyed the Democrat Party. I mean, we, we control the vast majority of state houses now. We control the Senate. We control the House. We control the White House. We're going to really control the Supreme Court. Thank you, Obama, you jerk. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think uh, there, there are so many people who are um, worthy of, of thanking, of course, the mainstream media, I think, by driving Trump supporters underground, uh, by, um, you know, when, when you scream – the most foundational and vicious vitriol and verbal abuse of people yeah. T turns out they don't like you very much. <laughs> you know, it's funny that way. You know, I mean, you've, of course, been an executive recruiter. I'm sure you don't scream at people how evil they are if they don't accept the job that you want to place them in and expect them to come back to you for the future business. You know, I, I, if you run a convenience store, you don't in install tiger traps and icy fire hoses and, and hose down your customers and expose them to tooth and claws and then expect them to come back. It is only in the weird upside down world of politics where people People don't face the free market, but they don't face voluntary yeah. uh, interactions that somehow this torrent of verbal abuse is going to turn into a, a successful outcome. Uh, and it was sort of implied with Obama. I mean, I, I feel to some degree that he was an affirmative action candidate in that people hoped that Obama was going to help heal racial divides. But of course, if you hoped Obama was going to do that, then you were hoping a government program called Healing Racial Divides was going to do anything differently than all the other governments programs did they achieve always the opposite hey we're going to have the welfare state and then there won't be any more poor people oh we created a permanent underclass uh, of poor people oh okay well you know more, more spending will help that um and um race relations, I think, are in a terrible state right now. And I think it was wonderful to see Trump uh, reach out and see support within the black community. When the left is in power, people see groups as monoliths, as you pointed out, as collectivist monoliths, you know, like one brain, many, many heads. Uh, but the great thing about seeing Trump, you know, and his adroit moving through various aspects of the Hispanic and Latino communities, which are not monolithic, and a lot of them hate each other, <laughs> moving into the black community and showing that there are a lot of pro-Trump uh, pro supporters among the blacks and among women, he really did begin to shatter the leftists put everyone in a big giant bucket uh and uh, you know i guess uh, the deplorables uh, recently uh, the deplorables have escaped the bucket they're out of the bucket <laughs> they're out of the basket what are we going to do and i really liked that about him that he moves among people as individuals rather than viewing them as collectives yeah yeah it really is great and and here's the thing is that Donald Trump is a, he's not an ideologue, he's a resultist, okay? He's a guy that thinks in the future, thinks of the result he wants, and then works back there and comes up with the minimum amount of steps that he needs to get there. And somebody who has grown up in government, their goal is not to save money. Their goal is to spend every dime because if they don't, then their budget gets cut the next year. They're not looking for the cheapest way to do something. They're looking for the most expensive way to do something because the bigger their budget, the more power they have. And they're there for the power. And you have a guy like Donald Trump who spent his whole life uh, basically trying to make a profit, trying to build the best product for the least cost and uh, you know make a profit. And that's one of the things that always attract me about a business person running the country. And I just, you know, I just liked, uh, you know, Trump's energy. And people said, yeah, but he said these horrible things, so on and so forth. Yeah, but you know what? Uh, on the one hand, yeah, some of that stuff might have come across as offensive. But on the other hand, the benefit was that people would hear him say their, that stuff. And they're like, you know what? We're getting the real deal from this guy because there's no consultant, you know, or, or uh, a focus group in the world that would have told him to say that. You know, so that's, you know, he was the antithesis of Romney, who was basically trying to be whatever each particular group he talked to, talked to, wanted him to be. Whereas Trump was pretty much always the same thing. You know, he was never pandering to us. He became the anti-politician and people were so sick 
of slick politicians were telling us what we wanted to hear. You know, so even though sometimes he would say things that were offensive in a way, I think that might have actually been a net positive for him because it, it did seem make him seem so unslick and so unhandled. Well, and I think this is something that the left really cannot process. Uh, and it's yeah. really, really important for people to understand. The left has moved so far from Judeo-Christianity, particularly from Christianity, that they view wrongdoing and an apology as a huge negative. Like if you apologize to the left, they'll double down on you and you just, you don't apologize to, to people who are just abusive and, and horrible and just trying to play gotcha games. You don't, you, you yeah. just play into their hands. You don't apologize. And so no. for the left, if somebody apologizes, they view that as a sign of weakness, that, that they've gained power over him, that he's now irredeemable and no one's going to vote for him and so on. Whereas, of course, Christians are very clear that human beings are born to sin uh, and that we all are going to say things and do things that we regret. And it doesn't matter that you've done them. It matters how you handle it afterwards. And when he came out and he said, I hate what I did. I'm a better man now. I'm always going to work to improve. I'm incredibly sorry for, for what I said. That is very powerful. Now, the left views that as, ah, we got him, and no one's going to ever vote for this guy. And the Christians are like, yeah, I've been there, and I'm probably going to be back there tomorrow because we're all going to sin, and we all need to be redeemed uh, in the Christian worldview. And again, the, the people on the left just simply don't understand that. They say, oh, well, Christians are never going to vote for him now. It's like, no, they're, they're voting for a mirror because that's their experience as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Trump, and I said this right from the beginning, Trump uh, did the perfect redemption curve in this uh, campaign. And what I mean by redemption curve is it's where it's like a literary device or a movie device where the uh, anti-hero becomes the hero. Uh, Han Solo goes from smuggler to galactic savior. Um, Jack Sparrow goes from pirate to the guy that saves the day at the end. Okay. And what happens is when someone goes through this transition, uh, people connect with them and they start rooting for them. You know, and then when they they achieve that that hero status at the end, the level of emotion is much stronger. And you got to remember, people don't buy logically; they buy emotionally. And after they own it, then they have to uh, justify or rationalize their experience with logic, so they don't get buyer's remorse. And one of the things that these uh, protests are doing for Trump going forward is that they are actually providing the logical rationalization to people who made that emotional decision that, yeah, we made the right choice here because we don't want this crap. And so they're actually helping us. So, Bill, now that you, of course, are in the prognostication game, um, what do you see um, uh, through the transition period, I guess, through, through to early next year and shortly thereafter? We won't ask you to go, you know, more than seven or eight years down the road with your picks for the price of Apple stock. But um, what do you see happening in the transition? Uh, and what do you see happening in the first, um, I guess you could say, 100 days of, of Trump? Yeah, I think that uh, Trump is going to pick a very impressive cabinet. I think people are going to be really excited about his cabinet, because unlike Obama, he's not going to be picking uh, uh, donors and uh, sycophants um, and uh, just ideologues, far left ideologues in his cabinet. Trump is going to pick the best athlete for each position. And I think people are going to be very impressed uh, with that. Um, I think that uh, as far as, for instance, one of the third rail issues in this whole thing has been uh, illegal immigration. I think that uh, what Trump realizes is that, uh, you know, he can't just hit every us with everything at once on the immigration enforcement because people would, you know, freak out. People have uh, compassion, you know, for these folks, even if they are here illegally. So what he'll do is he'll do the most popular things first and gather goodwill with that and then move on to the more difficult things uh, later. So I think he'll go right after getting the wall built immediately. He'll go right after deporting uh, violent criminals. You know, all these thousands or tens of thousands of violent criminals that Obama let loose in our neighborhoods without telling anybody. He'll get them out of the country. Um, he will uh, start uh, uh, imposing um, penalties on employers for hiring illegal aliens. Uh, he'll start to um, get rid of sanctuary cities. Uh, he'll start to get rid of welfare for the illegals. You know, one of the things I said on Twitter was, you know, if you don't want somebody to break into your house, don't offer to buy them lunch when they do, you know. And this is this is one of the things that is happening, that uh, America has become an, what's called an attractive hazard. What I mean by that is, if you build a, a pool in your backyard, and you don't build a fence around your backyard, and one of the neighborhood kids comes in and drowns in your pool, then you can you know get in trouble with the law for creating an attractive hazard. And for illegal immigration, America has become an attractive hazard. I mean, we're just 
you know, it's just it, they get free everything when they come here. And so I think if Trump removes that attractive hazard, there's a lot of people he won't have to deport. People will just go away because, you know, if you can't earn a living and you can't get a government check, uh, you know, if you want to survive. You just change the incentives go- and you don't need to go door to door. Yeah, you don't need to do a door to door, door and round people up and have a trail of tears type. You if know, you, uh, if you have a bathtub and you pull the plug, you don't need to bail it. The, it will just empty on its own. Right, exactly. And that's, I think that's going to happen a lot. So I think that basically building the wall, uh, deporting the illegals, getting rid of the sanctuary cities, getting rid of the attractive hazards, um, penalizing employers that hire illegals, cutting off welfare, I think that'll take up Trump's first term, basically. Yep. You know, so uh, and and the situation will be much better. Also, increasing uh, enforcement, uh, strengthening ICE, hiring more agents on the borders. All those things will be much better and will add tremendous uh, goodwill for the American people towards that. And, you know, nobody will would look at, you know, a bunch of gang members being deported and say, oh, that's, you know, that's not compassionate or whatever. I also think as far as if he does, if we do get down to, you know, deporting just regular folks, it's going to be a, uh, you know, a FIFO inventory method, a method, first in, first out. So I'm sorry, that's what I meant, LIFO, last in, first out. So the last people that got here are the first to go, you know. So it's going to be those people who have been here living peacefully for 15 years and have caused no trouble, they're going to be the last ones to uh, be approached for this. The first ones, the ones that just got here in the last year, so on and so forth, they're going to be the ones highest at risk, I believe. I think it's also important to remember that there will be massive market implications to uh, the drain of people uh, going back to Mexico, where, of course, they can work to fix their own country, which is important. I mean, the most ambitious and smart people constantly leaving Mexico doesn't leave a high talent pool for fixing the problems they're in Mexico and tends to accelerate that. But, I mean, we could do a whole show about this. I'll just very briefly mention that. I mean, just look at rents. I mean, if you have tens of millions of people or millions of people, let's just say, leaving uh, America because they're, they're illegally going back to Mexico or other Central American countries, just imagine what's going to happen to the rents for poor people with that diminished demand. And uh, that is going to be an enormous bonus to people who are poor and legal who want to better their lives. The, uh, a number of job openings are going to open up significantly, which means that demand is going to increase, which means that wages are going to go up. In the same way, the price of a lot of things is going to go down because there's less demand for housing. There's less demand for other things. Quality of education is going to go up enormously because you'll have a better student-to-teacher ratio. I mean, you could sort of go on and on, but understand the ripple effects for the people who remain, particularly the poor people are going to be enormous. It is going to be a massive boon and benefit to the poor, which Absolutely. is going to save government money rather than cost government money. People's taxes are going to go down. Uh, and uh, I just think that's really, really important for people to understand. It's the f- ripple effect of people leaving uh, is going to be enormously beneficial for the poor who remain. Absolutely. You know, it's kind of like uh, weeds and trees, okay? In my garden in front of my house, I mean, I can just completely weed the garden and go out there a week later and all of a sudden there's like a three foot weed growing in the middle of my, you know, rose garden. And it's like, wow, <laughs> you know, that's amazing. But I can just pull that weed out. It's very weak. It tends to be hollow. You know, it's uh, just uh, uh, not a strong, not a strong thing. But the trees in front of my house have been growing for years. And the slower something uh, grows, the uh, longer it tends to last. And I think that uh, Trump's approach to the whole immigration thing will not just be an all at once sort of thing, uh, but just to gradually do it over his four years so that it is a lasting uh, change and not like a weed that just, you know, can be uh, grows up fast and dies fast. Um, Also, I I was going to say one more thing. Oh, uh, yeah. About uh, negotiations. And a lot of people were afraid with Trump about uh, these tariffs that he's going to put on things and so on and so forth. And one of the beauties you need to understand is it's kind of like playing uh, poker. If everybody at the poker table knows that this particular player never bluffs, when he bets big, everybody folds. <laughs> right. You know, and here's the thing that when Trump as a negotiator, they know that this guy does what he says he's going to do. You know, when he said during the debates, I'm not going to go to this Fox News debate. He didn't go. OK, so well, he know they know that he's going to follow through. A lot of times they'll fold when he bets big. And if he says, I'm putting a 30 percent tariff on you, a lot of times they'll come to the negotiation table and that tariff will never have to go into effect. And it'll have the same same result because they'll renegotiate because they, they know that he'll do it and they don't want it. 
Right. I guess they're so used to executive orders that they don't remember that the president can be chief negotiator as well. Well, thanks, Bill, for a great conversation. Just wanted to remind people, go to twitter.com slash Mitchell, two L's, V-I-I. Uh, follow his stuff and be prepared to read a whole bunch of fantastic insights. Your Voice Radio, we're going to do another show after this, yourvoiceradio.com to check out his, uh, his show. And uh, thanks uh, again for the conversations that we've had in the past, the conversation we had today. Uh, thanks, of course, for the enormous work uh, and, and uh, reputation that you put on the line in pursuit of, of truth and enlightening people. I know you gave people a lot of hope, a lot of positivity, and that's a great legacy to lead uh, uh, to lead with and to lead into the future with. Thanks, Bill. A great pleasure. I'm sure we'll talk again soon. Thank you. Talk to you soon. Bye.